joining IXL. Um, and yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. So before we get too far into it, I want to make sure that you guys are signed in, have your accounts ready to go. Um, so you should have received that teacher activation email with your activation key there. So I have that up on the screen if you still need a few minutes to do that. If I could just get maybe one person from each site to give me a yay or nay in the chat box there if everyone is signed in or if you would like a couple minutes uh, to do that now. Overview of IXL and what we offer. So, IXL offers skill practice in four key subjects math, language arts, and social studies. Okay? We have practice in math from pre-K to calculus, language arts, pre-K to grade 12, and science and social studies, grades 2 through 8. So, I know that we're focusing on math and language arts today, so we're going to make sure to spend some time talking about those two subjects. A couple things to know about about IXL is that you guys see my screen okay? Oh, it looks like we lost my screen there for a second. Okay, there we go. Okay. So ISL um, questions are computer generated. So what that means is questions are not pulled from an item bank. So it's very unlikely that students are going to see the same question more than once. Another thing to note is that ISL practice is going to adapt to a student's ability in real time. So as students are working in ISL, if they are answering questions correctly and they're showing consistency, those questions will become a little bit more challenging. And also, if they start to struggle, questions will become a little bit easier. Okay? Last thing to note is that ISL is student case. So, what that means is students are never timed to answer a certain amount of questions in a given amount of time. We really encourage them to. Um, focus on their understanding and accuracy while they're working in that ISL practice. Okay. So here's our agenda for today. So we will talk about ISL from a student's perspective, give you guys a chance to practice as if you were a student yourself. We'll then dive into teacher analytics and explore some of the reports that are available to you to really monitor student progress and help you plan for instruction. I'll then show you how to select skills in IXL based on what standards you're working on in class with your students, how to communicate that to your students, and then we'll have some time to check in about rostering and also have time for any additional questions you may have at the end. Okay. So let's jump into IXL from a student's perspective. Okay. So You want to make sure that your students are logged in properly, again, so that data is uh, saved when they're doing all that hard work in IXL. You can always just do a quick check for understanding, make sure that they see that word welcome with their name, and then you know that they're signed in and ready to go. Okay. Okay. So this is what we call the student's grade level landing page. And this is where they will see all of those IXL skills that are available to them to practice. For skills that they've already done some work on, they'll see their current smart score in parentheses. So right now we're logged in as Meredith, and we can see that for skill M.1, she has uh, mastered that skill. She's received a smart score of 100. 
We also can see on this screen some skills that are highlighted. Those are a showing narrative. So these are skills that her teacher has selected for the class to practice. And so when she's ready, she'll want to go in and do those skills. And I'll show you how to get that highlighting uh, a little bit later on in your presentation. Since you guys are working with more than one subject, students will simply uh, toggle between those subjects using these icons under their learning tab. So if they're in math and then they need to switch to language arts, they can do that simply by clicking on those icons up here. Okay. So one thing I want to talk about that's new to ISO this year is the math diagnostic. So this is a really fantastic new tool uh, that you can use to get up-to-date information on how your students are doing in six key math strands. So students will access the diagnostic through their learning tab. So click on learning, go to diagnostic here. And what this is, is you can think of it as an ongoing assessment. So as a tool to a benchmark that students may take, you know, once in the fall, once in the spring, the diagnostic is an ongoing tool with no set start or end. It's a continuous thing that students will work on. And as they are working on that throughout the year, it's going to give you up-to-date information on their grade level understanding of these 16 math strands. So to begin that diagnostic, students will go into the diagnostic arena. They'll be given a choice of two questions to get started. And then they'll go through a series of questions that will, again, adapt to how they're doing. And will eventually pinpoint that level of understanding. One thing to note is that uh, at the beginning, students will need to answer about 60 to 90 questions in that diagnostic in order to get a full initial report. However, that does not have to be done in one study. Uh, so remember that the diagnostic is continuous. It's always the thing that students are working on. So you can break that up into smaller sections. Students can go in and out of that, out of that area uh, before they get that 60 to 90 question. Once you have that initial report, yeah, it's one of the first recommended I've that students go into the diagnostic about once a week. Take her five to ten questions just to really make sure that that score is being kept up to date. So this is what that student report will look like for the diagnostic. And you will also be able to, uh, to access all of your student uh, diagnostic reports from your teacher account as well. So you'll see those six key math strands. So we have numbers and operations, algebra, fractions, geometry, measurement, and data. And one important thing to note here is that we're seeing for some of these strands a bar, and for some we're seeing a dot. So the difference there is if we're seeing a bar for a strand, that indicates that this is the student's current level or range level of understanding, but we need them to do more work in the diagnostic in order to really narrow that down. So this student in particular right now is sitting between a 640 and an 840 for members and operations. So that's going to correlate to about a mid sixth grade to mid eighth grade level. Whereas for the algebra strand, we're seeing a single dot there with the score of 860. So that's telling us, okay, they've done enough work in the diagnostic uh, that, that, that that level has been received for that strand. So the goal is that by the time students finish that initial batch of 60 to 90 questions, you will see a dot for each of these strands as opposed to the bar. Okay. Another thing to note is that the diagnostic is also going to provide students with recommended skills on their recommendations wall. So based on how they're doing in those strands, I will suggest skills to students that are really meant to help push them forward um, in each of these math strands. Okay. So let's talk about that recommendation wall. So students will access that from their learning tab. And we just recently launched a uh, recommendation call for ELA. So now students will have recommendation suggestions for math as well as ELA. This is going to be a great place for self-directed learning. So as opposed to the skill practice, which is something you may assign after a lesson or for homework, uh, this is a place they can go for a little bit more exploration and freedom into what types of questions they're working on. And this is going to be a place that is going to provide students with skills being recommended to them on things that they may be struggling in, but also things that they're ready to be challenged in. 
So this is what that recommendation book will look like for students. This is an example of the math one. You'll see a lot of different math choices uh, that students can choose from, and each one of these is going to have an icon associated with it. So I want to go over kind of what those represent, because they're really great in helping direct students and what you may want them to prioritize when they go to that recommendation wall. So if you're seeing a question with the green star icon, that is telling the student that this is something new to try, something they haven't yet done before. The purple barbell, work it out. These are the ones I really like to suggest prioritizing. This is going to be connected to skills that students are struggling in, and these are going to really help them get over those trouble spots. The blue bud, the keep at it, is for skills that they are making progress in, but they haven't quite yet reached a smart score of 90. They go for the gold, it's for skills that they have to that smart score of 90 in, but have not yet mastered or reached that smart score of 100. And then lastly, the peel neck up icon is for extension skills. So one thing is going to be a natural next step for that student based on what they've already crafted. The ELA recommendations wall will have those same five icons. The only difference for the math one is that remember that the diagnostic is also tied to the recommendations wall. So on the math recommendations wall, students may also see a little green flag icon uh, that indicates those who are being recommended to students based on the work that they've shown in that math diagnostic. Okay. So while students are doing skill practice in ISL, they will often be in skill recommendations. So let's say they're doing a skill practice, they get to a question which really stumps them, they're not really sure how to move forward. One thing that's available to them is if they scroll down, they'll see the area where it says not feeling ready yet. And these are going to link them to skills that are those prerequisites for the one that they're on. So if they get stuck, they can go there, explore those other skills, practice that foundational work until they're ready to move back to that original skill that they got stuck. Okay, so I'd love to give you guys a few minutes to do some skill practice on your own. So from your teacher account, if you go to your learning tab, you can go to your subject and grade level, whatever you teach. I've selected a uh, grade math skill, but again, please feel free to choose any skill that correlates to what you teach. Choose a skill and do some practice as if you are a student. So uh, from your teacher account, again, you can ask like all those skills. So I would say answer about six or so questions. And while you're doing that skill practice, I'd like you to intentionally answer questions correctly, but I'd also like you to intentionally answer some questions incorrectly and take note of what happens, okay? So I'll give you all about five minutes to do that. If anyone has any questions or is not really sure what we're doing right now, feel free to throw something in that chat box or take yourself off the mute. Um, and I'm happy to walk you through that, okay? So we'll come back together in five minutes and check in about that skill practice. I did too. I did too. And, and I, I like it. I like it, but I would also say that the diagnostic is that I read last night. Is it ever in? She said it does. Yeah. Like, do you need to do 60 to 90 questions again? It, it was about 60 to 90. I was on there for about 45 minutes, and that's me. And I took it as a third grader. What they would push, I don't know, or what they couldn't answer from what we taught. And it probably took me 45 minutes to do those, the true, to where it said it had my level. So then she said she wants you to go back and do five or six of those every week. Five or six questions a week. But don't do the whole. You won't ever do that. No. no. It will just move you up. Yeah. It just moves you up or down on your scale. Right. So is that what we need to be comparing? I wouldn't necessarily do it weekly. Yeah, I would do it by week. I wouldn't necessarily do it weekly. Take a while.
think it's important for you to do, you know, she does do, take that 40 pounds and put it in She sleeps in a rocking place, and where you can see where they're at, and then truly, I feel like they're where I'm at. Yeah, but that was where you were. Yeah, but that's where it sleep. placed you. It got to the you can leave your baby for the you and answer my question for more. That's where you were at. No, that was just uh, eating until the end. Oh, really? And I had to skip. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I was taking it as a third grader. Then it lowered me. Forgive me. Well, that's not the other one. Yeah, but it's not worth the day. We don't have one. There's not one for you to like. Don't have the lowest which is good because then they would go, I don't know what this is. And the I don't know drop them down. The I don't know what, what is a fraction. Yeah. And it started somewhere for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, his, you would hope that his <laughs> level of students would know what the fractions are. So, I hope well, that mine know what it is. Yeah, but, but <laughs> in Ordean as a third grader, I thought they would have a third grade diagnostic, but I'm guessing no, no. it's 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 a general diagnostic. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. one of the stars had four fifth grade questions and they go up. That's it. And that's why I was like, man, some of those questions. Whenever you're implementing it, just making sure that the kids are looking at the I don't know why. I just want to give it away. If they get it wrong, yeah, if they'll actually read it. Yes, it's good. And I went, yes, and I went over it with them today. I showed them. You'll love it. You think it's so I had a nice lady, and I did my own, and I showed them what it does, and she went to the rifle tree. But then I went and I highlighted all my skills that I want them to go in on. I told them to look at the ones that are hiring. So I highlighted the ones we've talked about so far. So, and I told them that's what they need to be completing. That's what we're doing because they're going to work hard. They don't win they win. When they don't complete, it's not. It's been got you. Oh, it does? Yeah. Copy the link. I don't know. Why? 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 Why
Again, if the student gets to a level and they start to struggle, they'll bump back down to that previous level, get some more practice there until they're ready to try again. Okay. Students will also receive feedback if they answer questions incorrectly with an ELA skill. Then we'll review that question. And then one thing that you'll see me see with an ELA skill is a remember map. So we'll also cover things such as grammar rules or vocabulary that they need to understand in order to be successful on that skill. And then again, that solve box is how to answer the question. So let's talk about that SMART score. So as you're practicing, you should have seen that SMART score on your screen. And this SMART score is there to really uh, track students' path to mastery. This number goes up as students answer questions correctly and will go down if students answer questions incorrectly. But one really important thing to know about the SMART score is that it's not a percentage. And it's actually calculated by several factors. So it has to do with the number of problems the student has completed thus far, the number of questions they answered correctly or incorrectly, the problem complexity or which of those levels of rigor they're working in, and the consistency of correct answers that they're showing. So because it's not a percentage, we don't really recommend that the SMART score be used as a grade. Uh, but instead, one thing that I suggest is that there are different thresholds within the SMART score that you can use to set goals with your students. And I think those are really helpful so that students are not getting uh, discouraged if they don't get a SMART score of 100 for every unit. Okay. So let's do a quick check for understanding. So let's say you have two students who are working on the same skill. Student A starts off great, answers three questions correctly, uh, but then stumbles and answers the next three questions incorrectly. Regains the momentum, answers some more correctly, but then stumbles again. Student B, on the other hand, starts off with a little bit of a struggle, answering five questions incorrectly, but then regains some momentum and answers 12 questions in a row correctly. Which of these students do you think will have a higher smart score? Student A or student B? You can just throw your answer there in the chat box and you have a guess. Student C. B. 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 Yeah, I got a guess for student B. Anyone else? Yeah, student B. Nice job. So student B would have the higher smart score here and a lot of that has to do with that Okay, so even though they struggle at first, um, the consistency is what's helping them move through those levels of awareness. So see, we have a guess for A. So the reason why A would have a lower smart score here is because even though they are answering some questions correctly, because they're struggling with consistency, that is going to keep that smart score from getting as high. Okay, so nice job. Student B would have the higher smart score. Okay. So here are those thresholds that I mentioned that you can use to kind of set smart goals with your students around what you would like them to be going for that smart score. So when students hit different levels, they'll receive a ribbon underneath their smart score. Once they hit a smart score of uh, 70, we consider that satisfactory and we'll receive an orange ribbon. When they hit a smart score of 85, we consider that proficient and they'll receive a blue ribbon. When they hit a smart score of 90, they'll get that green ribbon. And this is where they will enter the challenge zone. And the challenge zone is only going to be the highest level of rigor for that skill. Okay? And then once they successfully complete the challenge zone, is when they've mastered the skill and they'll get that smart score of 100. Okay. Any questions before we jump into the next section? Analytics. I would say not of the questions. How do we go into our settings and get those certificates and not use? It's not enough. It's not enough. It's never enough. Well, I'm going to show you. 
All right, so I'll move along. If any questions come up, feel so free to throw them in that chat box there. So if you are following along with the chat, you are now in the analytics section. You can click on the analytics tab, and we're going to be looking at some of the reports that are available to you to help you really make sense of the student data and the instruction. So the first report I want to look at is the diagnostic report, and this is going to be connected to that math diagnostic student mistake. This is a fantastic report for differentiated instruction and really targeting and doing small group intervention. So for each of those six math strands, you'll get a diagnostic level at a glance. And I install the blue to your students for so supporting in the student range. And then we'll also provide you with top recommended skills for each of those groups. So this is a great report to use if you're doing a small math group or any sort of rotation style and you want ideas for what to prioritize with those groups, you can use those top recommended skills to really guide your instruction with those students. If you are in this report and you are seeing something that says, you know, students need to keep diagnosing, that simply notes that, you know, maybe they haven't finished that initial batch of 60, 90 questions, and so they need to do a little bit more work in the diagnostics before they're placed in those groups. So the next um, tool that's available to you is the real time. So this is going to be a fantastic resource if you have a situation where you know you are you have students on Chromebooks or a computer lab or something where you have several students working on ISL at the same time. This is going to be a great thing to use to really do in the moment intervention. So when you're logged in. Uh, all your students who are logged in and practicing to ISL, you'll get a student tile on your student activity wall that will show you what skill they're currently working on and what their current smart score is. And those tiles will be one of three colors. So if you're seeing a student's tile is white, uh, that indicates that they are on track, they're doing well with that independent practice, and they can keep on going. If you see a student's tile turn kind of that pinkish red color, that indicates that they started to struggle. So they are answering questions and actually they're not moving through those levels of rigor and they need support. So if you're in the real time center and you see, you know, one or two or three students' tiles turn pink, that's a great group to pull off of Excel, do some small group work with them uh, to help them get back uh, an understanding of the foundations of that skill. If you see a student's tile turn gray, like Maggie and Maria on the screen, that indicates that for whatever reason, they've gone idle. So maybe they've become distracted or they've lost their focus. Um, and these students you know, they just need a quick check in from you to help get them back on track. Okay. So the next report that we're going to look at can all be filtered. So know that if you want to narrow down for a specific date range, for a specific class, you can use this filter tool to really customize your report. The trouble spots report is going to show you real questions that your students have missed and will group students who are missing similar questions. So again, another great report to use for small group instruction, build those groups, pull those trouble spots, and review those questions with your students. You can really target um, what, what's kind of tripping them up and keeping them from moving forward in those skills. The skills diagnostic report. So I find this report super helpful because this one will show you which of those levels of rigor your students are working in for a particular skill. So let's say you've assigned a skill for classwork or for homework and you want to go in and see how they did, you can go to the skills diagnostic report for that specific skill. You'll get an overview of how many students have mastered, how many are still practicing. And then if you keep going down, you will get a box for each level of rigor of that skill, and you'll see which students are working in that level of rigor. So it's a great report to see you know, who is getting to those higher levels of rigor and is potentially ready for, for more challenging work, and who is maybe stuck at the lower levels of rigor and needs more support and more small group instruction. The next report to look at is the score grid report. So this one you'll access from that scores icon. And again, you can narrow this down by 
uh, using these filters for a particular date range or class or subject. And this is going to be a great report to give you an overview of those smart scores. So if you, you know, set those goals with your students, you can come to the scorecard report and get a quick overview of who is meeting those expectations. You'll see those ISL skills on the left and your students up at the top there. And then you have two options, two viewing options on this report. So the default will be to show you their best attempt smart score. Uh, but if you click on this best attempt arrow right here, it will switch to current. So you have two options there, either looking at their best attempt smart score, if they have done practice on a skill more than once, or you can simply view their current score. And then this report can also be exported as an Excel file, make it a little bit easier to print, transfer things to your gradebook, and so forth. Any questions on uh, some of those reports that we've looked at before we jump into the next section? I wanted to go back to the upper semester. Well, there is an upper semester. Because we know, I want to know for ELA where to find the week. I'm not going to repeat this report. I'll see how long it has. We have an hour. I think we have one question about the percentage scores. Yes. If the, score? Uh, the percentage, if there is a percentage score in ELA uh -huh. specifically. So again, so that smart score is not a percentage because, um, you know, a student, once they hit that smart score of 100, they've mastered the skill, but the student could get a smart score of 100 while still having answered questions incorrectly in that skill practice. Um, so because of the computer generated as the nature of ISL, um, as far as I know, there is not a way to get a straight percentage mm -hmm. um, because that could vary for every student. Some students may get to a smart score of 100 with a lot less questions than other students. Um, but again, you can use those thresholds for proficiency uh, and excellence to kind of set expectations as far as what, is, what you're going to count as a teacher uh, for a particular grade um, connected to that smart score. Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay. So let's move on to the yeah, next um, and then I'll just, section. Yeah. So selecting skills. So there are two ways to kind of find the skills that you're looking for based on what standards you're working on in class. So one is going to be through your standards tab, which will access from your learning tab, your first standards, and then you can narrow down by subject and grade level. And here you'll see the uh, standards in black text, and then beneath each standard, the ISL skills that align to that standard. And you can hover over that area to get a pop-up for what some of those questions will look like for your students. Okay. Another way to find what you're looking for is through the search feature on your home page. So you can throw in a keyword into that search bar. You'll get a drop down of all the ISL skills that relate to that uh, that keyword, and then if you'd like, you can also narrow that down by grade level as well. Okay, okay. and I know you guys are working with uh, Go Math textbook as well for some of your grades, so we do have a textbook alignment for that. So you will access that from your Inspiration tab. You'll click on IXL alignment and then textbook alignment and find your equivalent curriculum. And this is a great tool for working through that curriculum. You'll get uh, principal documents of the IXL skills and where in that uh, curriculum they line up to. So you're working through that curriculum, which is a really easy way to see which IXL skills are going to make the most sense to have your students work on for what you're doing in class. Okay, so communicating those skills to your students. So once you know which skills you want them to be practicing, you can highlight them on your screen. I'm actually going to jump to the live site to show you this really quickly. It's a little bit easier to see. So if you are in your learning tab, you will go to your subject. So for math, we can do math. You want to make sure that you are clicking on grades and not topics. So you click on grades, 
go down to find your uh, grade level that you teach for seventh grade. And then you're going to find those skills that you want to highlight. And then first thing we're doing is going to the pictures. I'm going to hover over that skill until that star appears to the left. And I'm going to click on that star. And that will highlight my skill. Okay. And so when the students log in to their account, they will see what you've highlighted. So that's kind of how you can uh, suggest and communicate which ones you want them to practice. To take or, away that highlight, you, you simply click on the star again, and it will take away that highlight for you and your students. Okay. You don't need to Another thing to note is from this from this page, this skills page. These little hey, green bars here room, are right? shortcuts to they that skill diagnostic. So nice. if you've but assigned your skill to classwork or for homework, and you want to go straight to that skill diagnostic report, the ones that show you those levels of rigor, you can click on these little bars as well, and that will take you there. No, he wanted to show his sister. He was really excited. He was really excited about it. No, no, he's like, it doesn't work. Okay, so another option for some is by copy and pasting the URL. So know that every skill in ISL has its own URL that you can copy and paste. So if you are working with um, any sort of shared document or a learning management system or any place you would put it in an external link, you can copy and paste that skill link into your document to create that hyperlink. And so that's a really great way to kind of send a student or group of students to a specific skill. When they click on that link, uh, it will first prompt them to log in and make sure that that data is saved. And then once they log in, it will take them directly to that. So now that's an option for you. You would simply uh, get that by going to that skill yourself from your teacher account um, and then copy and pasting that, that URL. Okay. So let's check in about rostering. So there are one or two options depending on whether or not you are a self-contained teacher or if you teach multiple classrooms. If you are self-contained, you'll simply build your uh, build your roster starting to type in your student's name and select them from that drop down menu. If you teach multiple classes, what you can do is click on where it says create classes. And what this will do is allow you to kind of make uh, smaller groups within that larger roster. So it will prompt you to name each class, so period one, period two, or whatever whatever class names make most sense for you. And that will create a new column in your roster uh, with a little drop down with those class names. And then you can then place each student from that larger list into the smaller group. So this is really helpful uh, because then when you go to the analytics report, one of those actions, remember, is to filter by class. So you can narrow down that data and look at our data for specific class. Okay. So let's check in about some additional resources that you can explore to help you uh, implement IXL in your classroom. So the first one is the certificate center. So you'll access this from your learning tab, and you'll go all the way to the end to award. And this is uh, an area where you will have certificates that are generated for all of your students um, as they hit different milestones within IXL. They're downloadable and printable certificate. You can print these out, celebrate student success, post them up in the classroom. Uh, so that's a great way to uh, kind of celebrate all the hard work that your students are doing in IXL. Another resource is the Common Core Alignment. So in addition to that textbook alignment in the same area on the site, we have a Common Core Alignment. So you'll go to Inspiration, IXL Alignment, and then common core alignments. You can select your uh, grade level for either math or ELA. And then this will provide you with a printable document that again will show you all of those ISL skills that align to the particular common core standards. There's a lot of different things you could do with this resource. Some teachers have used it you know, for their own planning purposes and mapping out different skills. Uh, you could print this out and provide a copy to students to help them track their smart course and set goals with them. 
Uh, so lots of different things you could do with the document as well. Can I ask if there's a way that they can read those? So we're about to wrap up. We have some time for uh, questions. If there's any questions that came up that I can answer for you guys, feel free to take yourself off of mute um, or anything else you'd like to explore on the on the live site. Yeah. I think it's for every what thousand. Well, you know, no, I've done something that makes it to where I don't get them because the only emails I'm getting is as a class. Yeah, that's what my yeah, kids answered. Like, oh. My kids have answered 30,000 questions. But like on the days that we use it, I'll get tons of emails. Really? See, mine, I, I've only done it this week. Right. I've only gotten a few. Right. And most of them didn't do it, so <laughs> I wouldn't be getting too many. I, looked, I, I assigned it to um, one class now. I think eight kids out of two classes did it. Hey, you know. Yeah, you have those certificates for this age. Yeah. Do you push under the mm -hmm. right, Well, if there are no questions, put my email address up on the board. Yep. So it's Shira L at IXL.com. So if any questions do come up while you guys are implementing IXL, please feel free to email me. I'm definitely here to help. Um, and I will I'll stay on the line for a little bit longer if any other questions come up, but if not, thank you guys so much for your time today, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. So nice.